Hey folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist, and uh, I am here to talk a little bit about hearing uh, in the environment. So um, I realized I am probably going to post this on Monday, but it is about a week early. Um, so if you want to go ahead and listen to it on uh, Monday the 30th, uh, you are more than welcome to, but you really won't have to really start watching these until probably the following week. Uh, the week of the seventh. So do kind of keep that in mind. So um, here's what we're going to be talking about uh, in this lecture. So we've already talked about the mechanisms of how hearing uh, happens in the ear. Uh, we've talked about the hair cells and the cochlea, and we've talked about the different parts of the brain that are kind of involved with this. Um, now we're going to talk more about some of the real world applications related to hearing that we do every single day. So the first part of this lecture is going to be a little shorter, and it's largely going to focus on um, localizing sound. Uh, we're going to talk about ITDs, um, ILDs, or sometimes referred to as IIDs, and DTFs. No, that is not the acronym you are thinking of. And we're going to talk a little bit about distance perception. Now, in our longer uh, second portion of the lecture, we're going to talk about processing of complex sounds, uh, aspects related to uh, scene analysis, continuity of sounds, and auditory attention. But we're going to start by talking about sound localization. And one of the things that is incredibly helpful about hearing, at least for human beings, is that our ears are basically 180 degrees from each other. And that's going to make it a lot easier for us to help localize sound. And we'll talk a little bit about the different ways that we can actually figure out where a sound is coming from in a given environment. So generally, if you've heard um, a siren, like uh, an ambulance siren or a police car siren, and if we were still in campus on Cotty and you heard it down Austin, you'd probably have a pretty good idea of where it was coming from. Now, that's partially because of localization of sound and also to a lesser extent, the Doppler effect. Um, but generally, you have a pretty good idea of where it is. Now, one of the things that is interesting is that a lot of the issues that we have with locating sounds, we also have with locating uh, the distance and depth related with visual objects. So we do have issues related to uh, correspondence. Um, we have issues related to the overlap of uh, auditory information. Um, and one of the things that makes sound localization kind of tricky is that regardless of where the object is in the environment, it's going to hit the ear the exact same way. Thankfully, uh, we are capable of noticing differences in the timing of a sound or in the intensity of a sound uh, to be able to locate things. And and as we're going to see, just as having two eyes really helps us with distance by taking into account binocular disparity, uh, two ears is also going to be very critical for judging where in the environment a particular sound is coming from. So here's kind of an example. So I want you to imagine um, that we are both looking at an owl and we're also hearing that owl. So here's what kind of happens. Um, here's what kind of happens when you see the owl. So each eye has portions of the left and right visual field. So it is getting, each eye is getting information from both visual fields, um, albeit they are going to be segregated and will continue to be segregated uh, in the visual pathway until the primary visual cortex. But you notice that, uh, for example, here's our left eye. We're only getting this portion of the visual field and we're also getting that in our eye. And they're occupying slightly different spaces in our retina. So you'll kind of notice here um, they're in a slightly different location on the retina. And so um, 
Each eye is only getting a very small snippet of information, and that's why having another eye is important. It's able to help us compensate. Now, likewise, this is where having two ears is helpful as well. So if the owl hoots, um, some of that information is going to go in the left ear, and some of that information is going to go in the right. This owl is also going to have that information, and because each ear gets information from both sides of the visual field, or the auditory field rather, um, we can actually use that information and those differences between the ears to figure out where sounds are, just as we use the difference in the positioning between our two eyes to figure out where um, an object is in the visual field. So one of the first things that we will find is that because our ears are located 180 degrees apart, uh, depending on the sound location, uh, sound the sound waves will hit one ear before they hit the other ear. So going back to this owl, this owl over on A, this particular sound is probably going to hit the left ear before it hits the right. For the owl on the right, it's going to hit the right ear before it hits the left. So this is basically going to create a very small time difference between the two ears. And this is what is known as an interaural time difference, or ITD. Interaural literally translates to between the ears. Um, so one of the things that's kind of cool, so really, when you're dealing with information in the environment, there's only so many that there's only so many uh, positions that an object can take around your head. So the environment around your head and around your ears takes up 360 degrees worth of space, which means that there are a finite number of locations that an object can be uh, with relationship to your head and to your ears. And so. Um, we kind of talked about um, binocular disparity um, as kind of being based on a horopter. So that theoretical construct for depth perception where if something lies on the horopter, there is no binocular disparity. They occupy the same point in the retina and there's no difference between uh, what each eye is getting. If it's in front of the horopter or behind the horopter, we have a difference. We actually have a very similar sort of theoretical structure for hearing. And sound locations can only occupy so many locations around the head. We have a finite amount of locations that can basically occupy 360 degrees. And so we can have this theoretical structure known as an azimuth. And so uh, an azimuth is basically uh, the angle. Um, so basically you can take the angle of a sound source on the horizontal plane relative to the point between the two ears. So zero degrees is basically straight ahead. And generally what we find is that for objects that are zero degrees on the azimuth, um, they're right in front of us, they tend to hit the ears at pretty similar points. 180 degrees is directly behind us. So let's take a look at some of these different things. So these ITDs actually vary based on their distance from this theoretical azimuth. So um, here is the front. So here we have uh, mapped on our x-axis, we have uh, the direction of the sound source, and we have the interaural time difference. Um, so the time differences, you can see, like because there are only really 180 degrees that we have to deal with, um, I know that I mentioned 360 degrees, but basically this is for one half of the environment. So you can basically think of the remaining 180 all the way up to 360 degrees as basically being similar in structure to this, but inverted. Um, what we tend to find is that Objects that are directly in front of us, like I said, they really have no time difference between the ears. As we move to about, um, about uh, 90 degrees though, 80 or 90 degrees, uh, so that's basically uh, your right ear, um, or it could be your left ear, depending on what you're working on. Um, it, this is a case where it hits one ear, so this is a sound that's coming directly 
that is matching up directly with my right ear, um, we can see that that is going to produce the largest difference. It's definitely going to hit the right ear almost instantaneously, and then it has to travel around the head uh, to actually hit the left ear. So the largest um, time difference that we see is when the sound is directly in front of one ear. But when we're talking about a sound being right in front of us, there's not going to be a time difference. It hits the left and right ear at equal points. As we get closer and closer to the sound being directly in front of the right ear, we see that the timing difference increases. So now we're at the point that we're at the right ear. Now we're going to move the sound towards the back of the head. And again, you can kind of see that based on these angles, they completely match up until once again, we are at 180 degrees in the back of the head and there's no difference between the two ears. So this, so there are a limited number of degrees that a sound can be located in in the environment. And as you can see here, because there are a finite number of locations, there are also a finite number of ITDs and they correspond to this structure. So when you put this into uh, context, so going back to all of those time differences, so we have the difference between a sound hitting one ear and the next, and you see it doesn't really get much higher than 600, we can actually map this onto the azimuth. So zero degrees corresponds to an ITD of uh, zero microseconds. Uh, 20 degrees, so cl slightly closer to this ear, than this ear, we get 200 milliseconds, 60, 480. Here is where we get the greatest ITD directly in front of one ear. That corresponds to 640. Then we start moving back towards the back of the head and we can see that the uh, ITD starts shrinking again until we get to directly in the back of the head and once again we're matched up at zero. Now here, now we're working with the left ear, and you'll basically notice that it's exactly like what you saw for the right ear, except it's reversed. Um, so for this instance, when a sound is in front of the left ear, the timing difference is going to be negative 640, and that's because we are dealing with the left side at this point. So we give it a negative because it's negative 90 degrees. Um, but you can kind of see here that there are a set number of ITDs that we can have. There are not infinitely many. And the really cool thing is our brain can actually calculate these timing differences and figure out where a sound is coming from. So you have to receive input from both ears to calculate an ITD. Um, if it only goes to one ear, you can't have that. Now, the ITD... Um, these are basically maintained throughout much of the auditory system, but as we start moving more um, towards the cortex, particularly the auditory cortex, these calculations tend to become less, less precise. And that's why the calculation actually happens early. So one of the things that I mentioned last week when we talked about the auditory system is that contrary to the visual system where most of the processing starts after information has reached uh, the cortex. Um, in the case of hearing, most of the calculation and the processing occurs before the sound ever reaches the primary auditory cortex. So the calculation has to happen pretty early. The higher up we go in this system, the greater the lag there is. So the calculation happens early and the big area that really calculates these ITDs are in the olives um, or the olivary nucleus. In particular, they will be, um, the area that's responsible for ITDs is what is known as the medial superior olives. This is where the input from both ears actually first converges. So this is incredibly early in that process. So now let's talk about interoral level differences or interoral intensity differences. So you can either call them an ILD or an IID. So just as with an interoral timing difference, certain sounds will hit one ear before they hit the other ear, here sounds will sound louder 
or more intense in the ear that is closest to the sound source. So it will be louder in one ear and then the other. And as we kind of talked about with ITDs, similar properties are found for ILDs. Um, generally, like we saw with our timing differences, the largest level differences will occur at 90 and negative 90 degrees. So once again, the largest level differences will happen at the right ear and the left ear and are generally non-existent at the center of the head, either in the front or the back. Now, unlike timing differences, ILDs are actually less precise. They do correlate with the angle of the sound source, but we have a problem. The head has an irregular shape. So think about your head. Now, the back of your head's pretty good. It's pretty smooth. Um, but the front of our head has extra stuff. We have extra bones. We have a nose. We have a chin. And that creates an irregular shape. And this has really important implications. So it turns out that because your head has such an irregular shape, and you can thank your nose for that largely, um, your head actually blocks sound intensities. So if we have a sound source coming from here, um, the head actually will block some of the sound energy and it actually will create what is known as a sound shadow. So this is especially true for higher frequencies. For higher frequencies, the head will uh, block that sound energy and create that sound shadow. This doesn't really happen as much for lower frequencies because they're a little bit more flexible and they can quote unquote bend more. So we find that because we get this in extra intensity difference due to the sound shadow, ILDs tend to work best for high frequencies. So here we are basically mapping different uh, ILDs uh, in the basis of decibels because that's our metric of loudness or intensity. And you can kind of see that um, this is 200 hertz, 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, 1800, 2500, 3000, 4000, 5000, and 6000. And what you'll notice is that zero, there's not really a lot of difference, or 200 hertz, there's not really a lot of intensity difference. And the same is true at 500. As we start getting to maybe about 1000, we start to see a change in the shape. But really, you'll kind of notice that what we should get is the greatest level differences for 90 degrees corresponding to the right ear. And you can really see that even for 1800 hertz and 2500 hertz, we don't really see a special advantage for the right ear. We don't really start seeing it until we get to these higher frequencies, particularly 5000 and 6000 hertz. So generally these level differences work best for high frequencies because of the role that that sound shadow plays. So how do we calculate ILDs? So we have, um, again, the olives are going to play a role in this. Now for ITDs, we had the medial superior olives. For ILDs, we have the lateral superior olive, olives. So um, the lateral superior olives tend to get excitatory connections from the ear that is on the same side. So the right superior olive will get an excitatory connection from the right ear, and it will get inhibitory information from the contralateral ear. So if we're talking about the right olive, it's getting excitatory information from the right ear and inhibitory information from the left. And then for our left olive, it basically reverses. It gets excitatory information from the left ear and inhibitory information from the right. And these connections will compete with each other. Generally, what we will find is that if there is an intensity difference between the ears, um, what will happen is we will get better excitation of information on the same side 
of that ear. So generally, if I have a sound coming to me from the right, I'm going to get more excitation from the right ear because that's where the sound is loudest. And I will get greater inhibition from the left olive or the left ear in this case. So they're competing with each other and they're trying to figure out where that sound is coming from based on the ratio of excitatory to inhibitory input. So here are our olives. So here we've got a uh, sound playing. Here is our right cochlea. Information is going from the auditory nerve to the brain stem. And then we go to the cochlear nucleus. And then immediately after that, we go to our um, lateral and our medial superior olives. So here is our lateral superior olive. Here is our medial superior olive. And you can see that we are also getting information um, not only, we're also getting, ah, go back. We're also getting information from our left ear at the same time. And you can kind of see that the left ear is providing input to the right olive and the right ear is providing information to the left olive as well. So this is where they're located. I'm going to go ahead and stop here and we will talk more about how this works in everyday life next time.